I'll mention what I had in mind today, along with the, the regular uh, exploration of our text. And the text is, uh, we're listening to the Sutra for Literature. Sutra as, uh, we're, we're listening for the language, we're listening for the ideas, for the flow, and we're also appreciating the translation that we have a complete English version of the 10 stages. And uh, so every week we, we listen and explore. Okay, audio's okay now, good, all right. Appreciate that. So uh, today we're gonna do that, but we're also going to have a special holiday edition of the 10 stages chapter, the first stage. We're going to, I got two songs, one of them is brand new, and I've got a chance for us to do some holiday giving the way Samantabhadra Bodhisattva approved it, which is giving with the mind. What does that mean? How are we going to, I'm going to invite you all to give with the mind through transference. We're going to do a guided meditation uh, for the last half hour, and I'm going to step you through uh, a chance to give dharma, to transfer your merit, to share your blessings with whoever you would like to share them with. And that's, that's how, we've, uh, how we've got today planned. Okay, let us go back to our slides because, here we go. Here is our invocation. So please join me. out of that program. Let's see, I have another note from Mrs. Uh, audio has a problem from the very beginning of the lecture. So if there's an important message, please repeat then. Yes, I will. So what I wanted to share was this being a holiday season, uh, we are going to honor our sutra as always, and then do something a little special today. I'm going to share a brand new song a Pure Land song, and I'm going to uh, invite everybody to join me in one of the best Amitabha Pure Land songs going, which is called Never Stop Reciting. These are both, both these songs are adapted from Christian hymns, 
I was talking with uh, my Dharma brother, my master Hung Lai today, we were both uh, commenting on, on how we were both raised in at, at Christmas time in the holiday season. We were surrounded by Christmas carols and hymns, and that was one of the very best parts of, uh, of our Christian upbringing was the music. And uh, last week we actually sang some Buddha carols, right? Silent mind, holy mind, all is calm, all is bright, deep vipassana, thoughts rise and fall, with pure insight, detached from them all, sit in heavenly peace, sit in heavenly peace. Um, so uh, we're going to expand that musical vocabulary today and uh, share uh, one of two of our favorite Christian hymns. One is called, How Can I Keep From Singing? Uh, no storm can shake my inmost calm when to that rock I'm clinging. And how does the last line go? Uh, at Lord is love is Lord of heaven and earth. How can I keep from singing? Right. So, the Buddha blesses heaven and earth. How can I? How can I? I'll never stop reciting. Is how we translated that one. So, that's coming up. Previews of coming attractions. And I wanted to talk about my desktop. Some of you are going, what is, what am I looking at? This is a visit to my cabin that has become a bird clinic, clinic for uh, disabled birds. Uh, it's visited by two young ladies and their dad. The dad is wearing green and the two young ladies, this is the Jie Jie and the Mei Mei, the older sister, the younger sister. And that's me in the middle there and I'm surrounded, we're all surrounded by, over on the right, we have a scrub turkey, bush turkey, we've got king parrots, we have lorikeets, and we have some goofy looking cockatoos who are flying in and out. So this is a celebration of the season. So, indeed. All right, let's take a look at our text for today. Here it is, right there. And I'm gonna read the Chinese uh, the way it is, but then I'm going to switch over to a retranslation of the English. Somehow, as we were putting together our document here, an older version of the English crept in, and it's stilted. It's um, when you're done, you feel like your mouth had a workout, your jaws had a workout. It's not doesn't doesn't flow. Chinese, of course, is as good as ever been in our minds, in our mouths, in our ears and eyes for hundreds and hundreds of years. So we're used to these sounds. The English, it's, there's a reason why we are retranslating the Avatamsaka. So, okay, close that guy. Here we go. Fozi Pusa Mohosa Zhu Yu Chu Di Ying Cong Zhu Fo Pusa Shanjishu 一应如是,推求请问,第三,第四,第五,第六,第七,第八,第九,第十,第中,相机德国,无忧燕族,我欲抢救,比地法。OK, okay, uh, I'll, I'll spare you the, the stilted English. We'll just go right to the newer version. Right here, I'll read it for you. Listen to the English. See what you think. See if you don't agree that a new, that we, that the li literature, the sutra as literature, that the language is a big part of comprehension. That sounds obvious, doesn't it? But that having a new English version, when the language doesn't stumble, the ideas go deeper. Here we go. Disciples of the Buddha, when the Bodhisattva Mahasattva stays on this first stage, 
He should go to where the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and good wise teachers are and ask them about the characteristics and fruition of this stage. He should do so tirelessly, with no weariness or satiation, so that he might realize the teachings of this stage. He should also go to where the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and good and wise teachers are and ask them about the characteristics and fruitions of the second stage. He should do so tirelessly, without weariness or satiation, so that he might realize the teachings of the second stage. He should, in similar ways, ask about the characteristics and fruition of the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth stages, and do so with no weariness or satiation, so that he might realize the teachings of those stages. So what's going on? I've mentioned multiple, multiple times that from our point of view, the, the 10 stages chapter is a handbook. It's a set of instructions. It's a curriculum. It's a how-to manual. If it was a if it was on your computer and available on the internet, it would be a PDF to download, a doc file. So you can, uh, that, that's, let's see, a PDF would not be a doc file. It would be a PDF you could download and read the instructions. It's a manual that you open to find out how to do it. Our Bodhisattva has now finished the instructions of the third or the first stage. We've come to the end of his specific instructions. And now it's talking about um, what, uh, how the Bodhisattva approaches all this new information. What does it say? It says he or she is now going to take that new information and ask how to apply it. It says he's going to go to where the Buddhas are, going to go to where Bodhisattvas are, or good advisors, and say, um, tell me what I need to know about this first stage and what should happen. What's unique about it, and when I put it into practice, what's going to happen? That's what I want to know, says the Bodhisattva. And it says the, the characteristics and the fruitions. So what's unique about it, and what happens to me as I practice these? He wants to know that clearly. And then it says, because this first stage is the foundation for all the rest, he says, tell me about the second all the way to the tenth. He wants to get the whole map all the way to Buddhahood. And he expects to get answers. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are going to give him the outline. He can't have the experience in advance, but he can have the, the um, prospectus. He's got his framework for everything he needs to know to, uh, to get all the way to success, to get all the way to the end. That's what he's, that's what he's looking for. Okay? Okay, more. We're going to run you through the whole, the whole um, outline. Today. There's a there's a there's a metaphor coming up as actually a an, an analogy. Shi Pusa Shan Zhu Shan Zhi Zhu Di Chang Dui Zhi Shan Zhi Di Cheng Huai Shan Zhi Di Xiang Bo Shan Zhi Di De Xiao Shan Zhi Di Fa Qing Jing Shan Zhi Di Di Chuan Hung Shan Zhi Di Di Chu Fei Chu Shan Zhi Di Di Shu Sheng Zhi Shan Zhi Di Di Bu Tui Zhuan Shan Zhi Jing Zhi Yi Che Pu Sa Di Nai Zhi Zhuan Ru Wu Lan Di Back to the retranslation. Here we go. Bring it up. This bodhisattva is good at knowing remedies for all obstructions of the stages, good at knowing the accomplishment and destruction of the stages, good at knowing the marks and fruition of the stages, 
good at knowing the attainment and the cultivation of the stages, good at knowing the purification of the dharmas of the stages, good at knowing the practices in turn for each stage, good at knowing what holds and what does not hold true for each stage. Add that word there. Good at knowing the most supreme wisdom for each stage, good at knowing the irreversibility of each stage, good at knowing how to purify and regulate all the bodhisattva stages up to and including entering the stage of the Tathagata. Change that. Tathagata. Come back here. There we go. Okay. All of those different aspects of the, uh, the entire curriculum, he wants to know. Um, when uh, I'm, I'm aware that of all the various, um, what happens if I do this? There we go. Of all the, ver uh, let's see, I need to do that again. Okay, there we go. Of all the various uh, Buddhist groups in the world now, the Bodhisattva path is probably the least known. And yet it's the, uh, in, it, inside our community, we call it Han Chuan Fu Jiao. The, the Chinese tradition, the Chinese Mahayana. And there are historical reasons why we don't know about it, which is uh, after 1949, monks couldn't leave China. So nobody carrying this tradition came out except our teacher, Master Hua. Um, so this entire huge, huge body of knowledge, the Mahayana Sutras, and then, wow, we have not spent 10 minutes talking about the Shastras, the commentaries, which are vast and vast and erudite and marvelous and profound and huge. We just, you know, it's just as if it didn't exist at all. And yet, as soon as you take one step inside the tradition, which means you pretty much had to go to China or to Taiwan or to Hong Kong or Malaysia or Singapore, or the Philippines, Vietnam, that's where you could find, and then in its Korean and Japanese versions of it, you could find the Chinese Mahayana tradition. But for the West, in English, and having anything to do with Western modes, nothing, not there. Uh, and yet, here's our teacher who, what did he do? Every night that he was breathing air in the West, he took 90 minutes and explained a sutra. It came to Saturday and people were not at work. He did it twice. Came Sunday, he did it twice, noon and evening. So he, need, he didn't rest, he didn't stop. And you think, well, really? Not at all? Well, Thursday nights, Thursday nights at Gold Mountain, uh, Gold Mountain Monastery, Shifu did not lecture, but it was student lecture night. And what did he do? He came down to listen. He would, he would be sitting there in the front row listening. And, and you could see he was, his eyes would twinkle. He would be making comments. And then when the student, whoever his turn it was to lecture was done, Shifu would go, you know, what do you all think? How did he lecture? Was it clear? Was it profound? You know, so that's how much he cared that this Dharma, these teachings, make it to the West. He explained it himself or he let his students lecture and then improved. He would critique their talks. He innovated. He gave us this method called activating inherent wisdom, which uh, was 
really, really innovative in terms of just classroom curriculum. What did he do? Uh, it's actually, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this story, which is what we're looking at today is the Bodhisattva is asking his teachers for a, uh, for a preview of coming attractions. He's saying, what am I going to learn? And how does this carry me to Buddhahood? How are my vows going to come alive if I follow this? From the first, he wants to know all the way to the end. And then he's, he's embarking on the, on the course. Right? So what did Master Hua do in terms of classroom curriculum, just the way this Bodhisattva is asking? He would, uh, um, remember at City of 10,000 Buddhas, we were hearing the Nirvana Sutra, Nepan, Dapo Nepan, Jing, Mahapari Nirvana Sutra, Master Hua was lecturing on. And oh, it's a big, big, big Mahayana Sutra. And uh, Master Hua would uh, send, uh, on a Wednesday, he would send in advance. Uh, the passage that he wanted us to investigate. And one of the nuns, for a long time, it was Bhikshuni Hung Xian. Bhikshuni Hung Xian would get the passage and she would type it up on a typewriter and then take it in to the office and the office would copy it out. And then like 10 paragraphs on one page, slice them up into chunks and then give everybody uh, who was in the in the audience uh, a copy so we could look in advance what was going to be lectured on then uh, Shifu would arrive from from San Francisco his driver would drive him up 100 miles on highway 101 to Ukiah turn right at Talmadge drive in a mile to city of 10,000 Buddhas Master Hua would get out of the car uh, grab his mail from the office and then walk over to uh, Wu Yantang, Wordless Hall, or Miao Yutang, Wonderful Words Hall. Um, they were side by side. And this class mostly took place in Miao Yutang, Wonderful Words Hall. And Shri Fu would come in, and there would be monks on this side, and the nuns on this side, and there would be laymen on this side, and laywomen on this side. There would be kids running around. Um, and Master Hua would come in, and and uh, look at us and then say, did you all prepare your passage? And we look at each other, <laughs> sort of a shirfu. And then he would say, okay, who wants to draw the, who wants to cho chan? And he would take a, uh, uh, a bamboo tube, a little bigger than this. This is kind of like the, about the right size, a little, little bigger around. And in the bamboo tube, there were all these bamboo strips. They were uh, tallies, right? They were about this long and thin. And uh, they, they had the names of the monks and nuns who were present uh, in, in, on each strip. And he would have somebody come up, whoever was in charge that day, and they would pull out a strip and they would say, oh, Guo Ting. Okay, well, Guo Ting was Hong Chao. And Shri would say, oh, Guo Ting, okay, come up, come up. Guo Ting would come up, and he would say, uh, well, I read the passage, and the way I understand this says is, he would read it first, just like I did just a moment ago, the sutra. And uh, somebody would read it in Chinese, because he couldn't read the Chinese. He would read it in English. And then he would say, okay, I expect this, blah, 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 blah. This is the principle. And oh, he would get down. And then I guess no, we stayed there. And then the next question was, what do you all think? Did he explain it clearly? Do you have any questions for him? Everybody's trembling, hoping that nobody's going to ask questions. He would say, okay, not bad. Next, pull another chin up, pull another tally, another tally. Oh, this time it's Guo Xiu, Dharma Master Hung Chu. Hung Chu would roll her eyes and go up and say, okay, well, I think the passage means this and this and this and this. And then translated, mind you, be spoken in English, translated in Chinese or vice versa. If the person could do both themselves, that's even better. And then Sheriff would say, okay, what do you all think? 
And then somebody would say, oh, I didn't like the way she said, oh, really? Okay, well, you do it better. And this is called activating inherent wisdom. At the end, there would be three or four or five of us who would, because our name was picked, we would be responsible for explaining that passage. And then Shurfu himself would say, well, I've listened to all of you, and I think what you said was really valuable. I hope the rest of you washed out your ears. She are linking and listen carefully to what was said. The way I think this passage means is different from all of you. I think it means this. And we would listen, and oh, we didn't, didn't understand that. You know? So what an incre incredible opportunity to grow in wisdom and in skill in turning the Dharma wheel, Chuan Fadlan. Shurfa would uh, give us this opportunity to, to, you know, stand in the line of fire and, and put ourselves out there. You never knew whether your name was going to be called. And if your name was called and you had not prepared, ooh, it was obvious. You would have to wing it, uh, right? So uh, we all took 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour before class and grabbed that passage and prepared a little bit. And sometimes uh, people would over-prepare and you could hear and they came up and they were very proud of themselves. They had a verse to recite and they compared it with other things. And it wasn't, it didn't ring true. It was an academic preparation, which was not what Shurfu was after either. Oh my goodness, you know. So, very wonderful, called Zhu Guan Zhi Neng Tui Dong Li. Zhu Guan Zhi Neng Tui Dong Li, activating inherent wisdom. This is a kind of pedagogy, a kind of teaching methodology that uh, kept us awake, kept us looking into the sutras, kept the sutras fresh in our minds, and also gave us a chance to listen to each other and learn from each other. And certainly, uh, if there had been uh, antagonism or competitiveness, that popped out right away. If somebody came in to the lecture hoping to lecture better than everyone else, you could hear that. Uh, if somebody came in and just, you know, mama hoo hoo, just messing around, not serious, that came out. But what Shurfu uh, rewarded, what he valued, was when you, you were honest and said, I don't really understand this passage, but what, it, uh, what occurred to me was, you say, ah, okay, what do you all think? That's, you know, this, the, the, Sincerity and liveliness was what he rewarded. And uh, certainly, you know, occasionally, somebody would just say, uh, this, this seems to me to be a deeper principle referring to this. And Sherpa would, you know, uh, silently acknowledge. Mm -hmm. When it was good, everybody heard it. You could hear it. There was no fooling, no faking. And uh, the, it was white knuckle flying, that is to say, nervous to, to go in there knowing that you might be called upon to speak Dharma in front of Shurfu and all of the other monks and nuns and lay people. They say, Pang Man Nong Fu, you're waving your cleaver around in front of the master butcher, Mr. Pang. Uh, you don't, in front of Mr. Pong, you, you know, you don't pretend to be a, a good butcher. He's, he was the best. So uh, that's, that's, mind you, we don't use a butcher's knife. We don't chopping up animals. But for the sake of the Cheng Yu, for the idiom, Pong Man Nong Fu, we're waving our cleavers in front of Mr. Pong's door, pretending to be great butchers when Mr. Pong is the greatest of butchers. Okay. So there we are trying to speak Dharma with Master Hua in the room. And uh, it was, if you were sincere and tried your best, it felt, you know, he was like, hmm, okay. And he would take people's contributions uh, at face value. 
they were fresh. They, he would, if you tried your best, he would say so. Uh, somebody would say, you know, say, well, this is number three of the Four Noble Truths, that third noble truth, and that you talk about the Four Noble Truths. And even if it was boring, Master Hua would say, Jin Jin Yo Wei. You say, that was really, really tasty Dharma, really valuable, really good. I hope you all listened, you know. So the point is that uh, learning the Dharma, studying the sutras, and using whatever wisdom we had to explain them was what he valued. He said, these sutras matter. And this creative way of processing them through our eyes, through our minds, through our mouths, um, drove that lesson home. So here's a teacher who wanted us to understand the Buddha's wisdom in our own lives. And he would say, if you have one part of wisdom, explain that part of wisdom. If you have 10 parts of wisdom, talk from 10 parts of wisdom. What's important is that you open the sutras, get your fingerprints on the pages, take them out of the glass cases where they're, they're preserved, covered by cloth and covered by, you know, uh, box, box sets, but nobody touches them. That's not the right way. Bring them out. Open the glass cabinet. Pull the sutra out of the box. Open it up. Look at it. See if it makes sense. If it doesn't, find out from someone else what makes sense, and then make it yours. That's how the proper dharma survives in the world. All right. I think I've walk that to the end of its road. Okay, here we go. Next one. Fords up did the put let me make sure let me make sure Niger Juan you sure push us under do you yeah yep okay. Oh I didn't mention the um obstacles. The Bodhisattva is good at we have ten shanji he's really good at this bodhisattva is skillful at knowing things that will, um, when you cultivate and you meet an obstacle, something that will bleed, sure, something that will remedy the obstacle. And I think this is fascinating because it acknowledges that it's not all smooth sailing. What would be, I'm going to come back, y'all enjoying looking at my desktop here? Um, what would be an obstacle to the grounds? An obstacle to the stages would be uh, things that I can't let go of. Things that, that block my mind. An example would be, suppose I'm just a girl. And I'm in a culture, a misogynistic culture where women are supposed to stay barefoot and pregnant, stay in the kitchen, stay out of sight. They're not supposed to talk. They're not supposed to think. They're not supposed to show an ankle. You know, they're, they're not allowed to be alive as a human being. They're distinctly unequal. Many, 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 many cultures in the world are still oriented that way. That's the way they build their society. Um, when it comes time to cultivate and take, be confident and overcome your fears and to be happy, all of those qualities of the first stage, right? The fivefold fears are banished. The, you're always happy because you made vows. You said, I'm going to become a Buddha. I'm going to take living beings across. But I'm just a girl. How can I do that? That would be an obstacle. That would be an obstacle. And the Buddha is here on the, the first stage. This bodhisattva is good at remedying obstacles to cultivation. What would that be? Well, what are those gender characteristics that I mentioned based on? They're based on this body. Where does the Buddha Dharma go? The Buddha Dharma goes to the nature inside the body. The 
we hear that when the Buddha says all living beings, that includes what? He's talking to animals. He's talking to ghosts. He's talking to devas, gods in heaven, who are in a body with more blessings, but equally mortal, equally able to die. He's talking to beings in the hells. He's talking to asuras. He's talking to other bodhisattvas, arhats, pracheka buddhas. The Dharma is spoken to nine levels, not to other Buddhas, but to everyone else. So what's the difference? Bodies. So don't be attached to half of one Dharma realm, the female half of the human Dharma realm. Uh, I remember early in the days, uh, Gold Mountain Monastery, when Buddhism was just getting going in America, the earliest time, uh, there, the, uh, we, all we had at the time was Gold Mountain Monastery. This is after Buddhist Lecture Hall, but Gold Mountain Monastery, like the, in the early 70s, from 1970 to 1974, 75. Um, the women lived on the second floor and the men were on the third floor. And at one point, the, everybody moved across, the women moved out and went to uh, Washington, to our house on Washington Street, the International Institute for the Translation of Buddhist Texts, it was called. But while everybody was together at Gold Mountain Monastery, uh, there was friction between the men and the women. And there was bickering, and there was fighting. And there were times when I remember I was a graduate student. I would come across on the weekends and t help translate. And I would hear some of these, the stories in progress. And the, uh, the women at a certain point learned to give as much as they took. They weren't, they weren't passive at all. And, but the, uh, um, the slighting and the jealousy and the backbiting was all there and the slandering and the uh, competition, all that stuff was going on. Meaning what? Meaning even though people were, had their heads shaved and were wearing robes of monastics, their worldly habits followed them into the, into the monastery and their social interactions. So the men were fighting with the women, the women were fighting back. Master Hua, at one point I was there when he said, okay, he said, I'm fed up with this pettiness that you're displaying, very worldly attitudes of slander, schism making, and just out and out fighting and competition. He said, you men, don't be so arrogant and assuming that you've got a male body and that's just the way it is, that you're a man forever and forever. He said, you know what determines the body you have? how hard you cultivate, how many blessings you have, how much yang energy you've got that you cultivate every day. He said, even though you've taken the precepts, if you don't hold the precepts and instead let your mind look down at these women and feel that they're somehow inferior to you and spend all your time looking, instead of at your own nature, at your own mind, you're looking sideways at, at women and competing with them. He said, that's yin, that's dark. That's affliction. You know what's going to happen? You're going to lose your male body. He said, if you come back as a woman, you'll be lucky in a female body. You might even lose your human body. He said, meanwhile, these women, you know what they're doing? They're taking your abuse. They're taking your slander and your backbiting and your jealousy. And that builds their character. That's creating merit for them to, to cultivate renru polomi, patience under insult, the paramita of patience. He said, you know what's going to happen? They're going to come back in a body full of yang energy as men and cultivate past you. They're going to get to Buddhahood first. Don't be so arrogant, he said. And the men are like, we didn't know that's how it worked. <laughs> so, yeah, truly the case. How, where do the bodies come from that we get? How do we become a deva? We become a deva by cultivating the five precepts and the ten wholesome deeds, the blessings that come from that create a body that even can transcend in can can ascend in the ten dharma realms to the stage of deva if we meditate and enter the dhyanas 
we can master dhyana samadhi, we can become a, a Brahma god, right? That kind of samadhi takes us beyond the desire realm gods into the second tier of, of devahood in the, the dharma realm of gods and devas. That's where it comes from. So cultivating blessings uh, changes us out of these bodies. So my point is to what? To say, what is an obstacle to the grounds? Is thinking, oh, I'm just a girl. I've always been this way. I, my horizon is very limited. I just have to follow my brothers, my father, my boss, the, my husband, you know, even my son. I have to listen to him. You know, well, that's really, that's an obstacle. You know, the, uh, the Dharma is here for liberation for setting us free. And what if, here's another obstacle to the grounds, what if we're locked into a relationship with a member of our family? Let's say we're a son and we're struggling with our father. And for whatever reason, dad is really hard on me. Suppose I'm the oldest son. I'm the firstborn. And my father has all these expectations of me and he never gives me a day of peace. He's always on my case. Nothing I can do will please him um, to the point where I just don't even come home anymore. I stay away and I hear the sound of his voice and I, my muscles tense up and I think nasty thoughts about my dad. You know, this is hypothetical, right? This is suppose, I said suppose, there's a case like this. Does that relationship sound possible? Yeah, yeah, it's possible. Uh, another relation, suppose you never met your dad. Suppose you have an absent dad and uh, you just wish, you just wish, you long for some contact with your father, any kind of contact. And that place where uh, kind, firm authority and shaping and molding should be isn't, isn't there. Another hypothetical, maybe that's your case, maybe not. Um, what about that? Are those obstacles to the ground? They can be. They can be because why? We're hoping for something different than the way it is. So both of those are obstacles. And our bodhisattva is good at remedying, remedying those obstacles. He's able to, the bodhisattva has uh, been cultivating his own giving. Remember the last thing we did last week was our bodhisattva was practicing giving, 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 right? He was learning how to give, make offerings to the Buddhas and all kinds of, of uh, planting of fields of blessing, as it's called. And those fields of blessings are now blossoming and ripe. So those blessings allow him or her to go, yeah, that's a habit pattern from the past, but I want liberation from all habits and the self that those habits serve. I don't cling to myself. That self is alive, it's flexible, it's growing, it's plastic, it's in progress. So I'm going to, every time I have a thought that says I'm locked into this negative pattern with my mom, with my dad, or I'm longing for a relationship that doesn't exist because he's gone or she's not there, let it go. Just let it go. Those are in, lives in the thoughts. Catch the thoughts, see them rise, let them go, and progress into the stage of happiness, bodhisattva's stages. So all of those kinds of obstacles, the bodhisattva is able to, able to remedy those. The mind is bottomless. It's not fixed. And the point of samadhi that we get when we recite sutras, say we're reciting a Lotus Sutra, for example. Mm. The stillness of mind, the grounding, the anchoring that we feel, it's like a big, deep roots of wisdom that emerge from reciting sutras, whether it's the Lotus or the Avatamsaka, the Sharangama, whatever it is, the Vajra Sutra, Earth Store Sutra, Medicine Buddha Sutra. As we recite those sutras, our human roots go deep. And then what happens? Those old patterns rise up face to face with that person who we're having trouble with. You see it. 
you see that thought and you go, nah, not this time. Let it go. You go free. Be free from that thought. And guess what? Pop. It's like a bubble. It's like a fart. Pop. Gone. Ah, clean. Right? Clear. I don't have to be ruled by those thoughts. I have remedied those obstacles to the to the grounds. Oh, and then the person who we have that trouble with, they see us and they're like, are you the same person? You didn't, I couldn't press your button. I pressed your button and it, you didn't jump. Hmm. A new day. That relationship becomes choice instead of karma. Yeah, that's liberation. All right. One more, one more. Here we go. One more time. Okay, one moment, let me grab it. There it is. Disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva in that way is good at knowing the characteristics of the stages. Starting with the first stage, he practices without interruption. Continues in that way without interruption until he masters the tenth stage. With the light of wisdom of these stages, he accomplishes the Tathagata's light of wisdom. So, wisdom here is compared to a light. And that image occurs in the sutra all the time. Uh, images of darkness being overcome happens all the time. Happens all the time. Uh, we ask Shifu, Shifu, what is virtue? What is Gungda? He said, it's just a light. I think it really means it's a light. Where does the light come from? It's an inner light that the Buddha has refined to purity, to white light. Um, sometimes somebody comes in, a stranger, and you don't know quite why, but you feel some antipathy, a little, your, your muscles tighten up. What is it? It's probably darkness, probably a sense that your light sensors that you're ordinarily not conscious of get occluded by a person's lack of light. And somebody walks in and you just, you feel your heart open, you feel there's interest, there's a click almost. And what is that? There's light radiating that, again, we're not conscious of, it's maybe it's not anything we see with our physical eyes, but you certainly feel it. And this uh, wisdom light of the Tathagata is what the Bodhisattva is looking for. And notice the thing that I wanted to point out on that last passage is what? He practices without interruption, Wu Duan continues without interruption all the way to the 10th stage. And that brings me to something I want to share. Right here. There it is. Do you recall a few months ago, we had a section of the first stage where the Bodhisattva was um, making vows. Remember the vows the Bodhisattva was making? And it was Guang Da Lu Fa Jie, Jiu Jing Lu Xu Kong, Jin Wei Lai Ji, Yi Chie Jie Shu. There was this refrain after every one of the ten vows, went like this. This I, I bring it back because I think this is uh, this is going to survive. This is one that we will be singing for a while. It's an Avatamsaka melody. Vast and great as the Dharma realm, 
ultimate as empty space to the ends of future time throughout all numbers of eons without cease without cease without cease remember that one I like that uh, these little nuggets, kind of little arias that arise out of the text that help us um, remember what they're talking about, which is what? Our bodhisattva has liberated himself or herself from old habit patterns because why? Samadhi, because their minds are quiet. Because why? They're cultivation. Maybe you're reciting a sutra. Maybe you're a meditator. Maybe you're just doing karma yoga. Maybe you're bowing. Maybe it's a mantra. Whatever practice you're doing, it's having an effect in your mind that the thoughts are not like static on the radio. <laughs> There's space and silence in your mind in between thoughts that rise. And when those loser thoughts like, oh, that's my mom. I got to react. I can't let her do that. When that thought rises, you go, nope freedom. I'm going to get free of that. I'm going to let it go, set it down. You do it once, and then you do it twice, and you do it again, you do it ten times, you have a new habit. It's Wu Duan Jie. Never stops. Fast and great as the Dharma realm. Continue. Ultimate as empty space. Once again, to the ends of future time. It's your to control. Throughout all numbers of eons, without cease, without cease, without cease. Let's do it one more time to make it a habit, right? Fast and great is the Dharma realm. Ultimate as empty space, the most ultimate thing. To the ends of future time, which is never, right? Never stops. Throughout all numbers of eons, without cease, without cease, without cease. That's our little Avatamsaka Sutra Arya that pops up when it's time to quit and go back to the old habits, let her push your button, get angry, nah, nah, we prefer freedom, thank you very much. Um, I, oh, it went away. What I want to share with everybody is um, this one. We are, today was the last day, Christmas Day was the last day of City of 10,000 Buddha's Amitabha recitation session of a week. Um, it's the first day of our Amitabha session here at Gold Coast Drama Realm. And uh, I have an Amitabha song. The Buddha Amitabha, Limitless Light, Om Yi Po Fo, is um, the, this limitless light we bring up at the time of the winter solstice here in Australia, it's the summer solstice, because Wuliang Guam, limitless light. Light that doesn't have a limit, doesn't stop. And uh, the, uh, in the time of the shortest days, we bring up light, like in Diwali, right? The Hindu celebration of light. And Christmas, festival of lights. Hanukkah, candles. And uh, Kwanzaa, beautiful lights. So everywhere when the days are short and the nights are long, of course it's the opposite here in Australia, uh, we celebrate this light. So the, uh, this, I'm proud of this song, uh, comes from, the, the melody came from How Can I Keep From Singing, this beloved Christian hymn. And uh, this is one of the few songs that my Dharma brother from the Catholic tradition, Cyprian Concilio, uh, Father Cyprian, said he wished he'd written. He said, he liked my line, 
I praise the Buddha's compassionate vows with melodies unending. My body lives in the world of woe. My heart is world transcending. He said, ah, I love that. That's a good line. And he is a master at songcraft. So whenever Father Cyprian likes something I write, I go, mm -hmm. So a Buddha named Eternal Light made vows to save creation. He made a land where suffering's gone, a place of liberation. So use his vows and be reborn. In lotus flowers delighting, you simply keep his name in mind and never stop reciting. Wudwanjie, right? The Saha land is a place of pain with struggle and contention. To find a world of utmost bliss, you first set your intention. Those, women, those men or women, rich or poor, in rebirth not delighting, apply themselves with a single mind and never stop reciting. I praise the Buddha's compassionate vows with melodies unending. My body lives in the world of woe. My heart is world transcending. With bodhisattvas joyfully, I'll soon be reuniting. Until I reach Amitabha's land, I'll never stop reciting. Until I reach Amitabha's land, I'll never stop reciting. Okay, so that's how the song goes. And uh, I want to offer it to everybody on today, which in America, North America, is Christmas Day. This is a song of bright light. And lots of folks, lots of folks have um, had their plans disrupted because of the, the new variant of the coronavirus. And um, that's miserable. That's really sad that so much joy was, was obstructed, was prevented because of airlines just not having pilots show up because they're sick or baggage handlers or... Uh, ticket vendors and uh, the security in the airports, you know, when half of your security crew is at home because they tested positive, what are you going to do? So they shut, they cancel flights worldwide and that's, you know, all those plans disrupted. Miserable for the second year in a row. No fun at all. So one thing we can do, one remedy to that is to say, uh, raise our eyes to the horizon, look long, say, I'm going to recite the Buddha's name. I'm going to recite Namo Amitabha. And understand that our world, this is a world, there are worlds that are happier, there are worlds that are worse than ours. So let's make this a, make this a place of bright light, from starting from the mind. And...
more time. Here we go. Last verse. Here we go, Bo. You ready? I praise the Buddha's compassionate vows. His melodies unending. My body lives in the world of Transcending with bodhisattvas joyfully, I'll soon be reuniting until I reach Amitabha's land. I'll never stop reciting until I reach Amitabha's land. Never stop reciting. Okay, now I'm going to invite everybody to do something characteristic in the season of giving, in our holiday season, which is do some giving. Let's do some giving with our thoughts. Um, it's called transference of merit. Take all the joy that comes from the light of liberation, knowing that uh, we're empowered to end our own pain and that we can teach others to do the same. That pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. As our bodies get old, get sick, and pass away, that's painful, but there's something inside that doesn't die, something that is eternal, and that's our Buddha nature, our spirit, our soul, whatever name you want to give it. So let's focus inside, turn our attention inward, and observe that undying, deathless place, the calmness and the quiet. Exhale, and in the calmness of our mind, let's spread out our metta, our loving kindness, so that all beings will be well and happy. Just as we wish to be well and happy, we also experience this wish that all beings, the ones closest to us, nose far away. May they all feel well and happy. And in this wholesome state of mind, we can share our merit with all the Dharma protectors, all the dragons, all the devas who are guiding and protecting us, including the guardian devas in the local area where we live who have been here from time immemorial, the traditional owners of this land. May they rejoice in this merit. And as we all participate in the sharing of this merit, 
May they swiftly reach final liberation. May they give their blessings and their protection to all. May we also dedicate merit to our departed relatives, our teachers, to our friends, whoever comes to mind as we breathe. We send a good wish to them wherever they're reborn. May they have an opportunity to receive the Dharma, to be guided so that all grow in the Dharma and be liberated from the cycle of rebirth one day. With all of our good thoughts and the merit we've acquired, may we all make a wish and an aspiration that this merit will pave the way for us to develop further, purify our mind from the tendency to grasp in all the kinds of clinging attachments that become obstacles. May we all go free from the tendency towards anger and hatred, grudges, the tendency towards delusion. May we all cultivate the qualities of generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom so that we live in the purity of mind that gives us the strength to confront and to overcome obstacles, habit patterns that arise in our lives, that will grow in wisdom and compassion, that will be able to make good use of our lives not only for our own happiness, but also for the welfare and the happiness of all living beings. May all the merits that we're sharing today pave the way for us to progress in our lives so that we succeed in whatever we do. May we be able to fulfill our worldly duties and our responsibilities. And at the earliest opportunity, may the seeds of enlightenment take root in our hearts so that we can walk the noble path and be free from all suffering one day. May we also have the wisdom and the compassion to help others, whoever comes our way. Please make this your own. Let your wish rise. Make our aspiration for Bodhi once again. This time as it rises, whatever immediate problems or difficulties, whatever obstacles that we have in our lives, may we have faith and confidence in the Buddha, in the Dharma, in the Sangha. We will be able to overcome these problems. They will come into the path of our practice and our potential will swiftly develop to be able to absorb and transform all these obstacles into full potential for wisdom. May we accomplish whatever we need to accomplish in this lifetime to lead us on the path to Buddhahood. As we conclude, please take this opportunity to think of those who are near and dear to us and to bring them into the Dharma. All right, that's our gift, sharing with our minds in the transference. Um, I need now to tell my Christmas story that I tell every year. You may have heard it 
every year and you may be tired of it. Maybe you can tell it better than I can by now. But it's one of my favorite Christmas stories. And my Christmas stories, that includes the year in 1983 that I spent Christmas underneath the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya. making a vow to stay awake all night, not to lose a second, and an hour later, <laughs> sleeping under the Bodhi tree. Oh. But that's not this story. This story comes from my first experience with an Amitabha session at Gold Mountain Monastery. While I was, I had taken refuge, but I had didn't, know what it meant to cultivate, I hadn't had the experience yet. But I determined that I was going to step into real Buddhist practice. The, the announcement came, this is 1973, the announcement, there was going to be a Taba session at Gold Mountain. Determined I wasn't going to do other things this Christmas over my holiday, certainly not going to stay in my Berkeley commune, which would have been a very different experience than the one I was planning for, Gold Mountain Monastery. The hallmark of the Berkeley commune was into it. Whatever it was, they were into it. Whatever substance of the month. No thanks. So I packed my backpack to go across the bay. I was going to spend a week at Gold Mountain Monastery. And I had with me my Christmas stocking. I don't know if people know what a Christmas stocking is if you haven't grown up in a family that celebrates Christmas, but a Christmas stocking is a big sock that uh, you put on the, on the mantle over the fireplace in your living room and you come down in the morning and Santa Claus will have come and stuffed your stocking with all kinds of little goodies. Uh, my mom made Myself, my older brother Steve, my younger sister Liz, Christmas stockings. They were red velvet. They had white fur trim and green felt adornments of candy canes and Christmas trees. And they were as splendid. And they had our names on them, Chris and Steve and Liz. And uh, they were wonderful Christmas stockings. And, and we hung them up on the mantle every, every Christmas Eve. And sure enough, in the morning, there was goodies in there. Uh, so I, you know, when I came to California to study er, years, four years earlier, I had brought along my Christmas stocking. So there it was in my apartment in Berkeley, and I put it in my backpack. I thought, well, I'm a Buddhist now. i got to figure out what to do with this old symbol of my old faith. I don't know what to do. So I took it across to Gold Mountain. Strange. So I got there. It was dark, and somebody took me up to my room on the third floor, and I had my sleeping bag, and I, I made a, I found my bed and in the room, and and uh, started to unpack. And here was the stocking. What am I going to do with my Christmas stocking? It's for when I was a Christian. I'm a Buddhist now, and they, they're totally incompatible, right? So I had it, and I thought, golly, my mom made it. I can't just throw it away. What am I going to do with this? So I thought. Well, I'll let the the other layman on the floor, the third floor here at Gold Mountain, throw it away for me. I thought, I'll just put it out on my door, and uh, I'll come in the morning, and I'll probably find it in bits, you know, in the trash. Somebody will have torn it down. At least I didn't have to throw it away. That's probably the best thing. So that's attached to it. I'm at, I acknowledge it. It's my mom's, my mom made it. So I put it out on the door, and to sleep and then I heard <laughs> 3 30 in the morning time to get up to go down and do Zalka morning chanting first morning oh the Amitabha session and then I thought oh my Christmas stocking so I rolled up my sleeping bag put on my scarf put on my hat put on my gloves Cold, Gold Mountain Monastery, San Francisco in the winter, boy. <sighs> Chilly. Uh, so I bundled up, rugged up, as they say in Australia. And I opened the door and I looked on the ground to see where the stocking had been torn to bits. 
And I looked up, and there was my Christmas stocking hanging on the door, chock full of recitation beads and little Buddha images and little sutras wrapped in plastic, you know, miniature sutras and candy bars and candy canes and gifts. And I, I experienced my heart open. It's like, these Buddhist laymen not only did not destroy my Christmas stocking, they embraced it and welcomed me in a Buddhist style with all kinds of little gifts, little rolls of film, because I was a photographer. And I felt a tear, you know. It's like, why was my heart so small? I didn't appreciate Buddhism. I thought all religions fought with each other. And I learned that there's more to great compassion. There's a real practice of great compassion. So I, you know, so transformed on the spot, I took that Christmas stocking put it in my room and came downstairs. I walked down the big, tall, steep staircase, came around the corner of the big Buddha, hall, Buddha house and bumped into Master Shenhua. Sure, who was standing there with a big smile in the light of the Buddhas coming from the Buddha house. And he said, Merry Christmas, he said. <laughs> and if there's anything that that I can point to that brought me into Buddhism more quickly than anything else. It was that experience of the practice of great compassion. In fact, I wasn't rejected and my old habits weren't violently destroyed. That's not how wisdom works. Um, so that's my favorite Christmas time Amitabha session story from my own experience. Okay, uh, let's see here. One more. I promised two songs and I've only done one. And I'm kind of waiting to see if uh, the time will run out and I won't have to share this, but why not? Why not? Uh, another hymn. What are they doing in heaven today? gets transformed as what are they doing in the pure land today? What are they doing in the pure land today? Their suffering and sorrow are all gone away. Praising Amitabha cultivating the way. That's what they're doing there now thinking of friends whom I used to know who suffered and sorrowed in this world below but they've gone off to the pure land and I want to know what are they doing there now what are they doing in the pure land today where suffering and sorrow are all gone away Listening to Dharma, mindful night and day. That's what they're doing there now. There's some who recited night and day without cease. Their hearts on the pure land seeking release. With faith vows and practice, their cultivation was true. Tell me, are they in the pure land right now? What are they doing in the pure land today where suffering and sorrow are all gone away? The misery is over, joy comes to stay. That's what they're doing there now. That's what they're doing there now. So we'll bit by bit take these uh, Christian hymns that are familiar, borrow them, transform them, adapt them, and uh, 
bring the tradition forward. So, okay, uh, at this point, I'm going to dial up the Berkeley Monastery website and ask Jin Chuan or Jin Wei Shi what is going on. Uh, anything we want to know about the Berkeley Monastery program? Hello, everyone. Hello. There he is. Oh. Hi, Jin Wei Shi. Ami Tofu. Ami Tofu. Hello. Uh, uh, Merry Christmas, Christmas and Happy Holiday. Happy holiday. Oh, where's the echo? echo? It's from Dharma's side. Is that from my side? Mm -hmm. Should I? I think, I think so. so. Okay, I can mute myself. Okay, so we uh, have a few announcements. So the first one, tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. at California time, uh, Rabbi Hang Shur will give a lecture. He's the third for his series yeah, of lectures. Yeah, third series of lectures. And you can find on our website a link to Zoom. And I believe this also will be um, YouTube, right? And uh, if, no, it's, this is going to be through CTTB Live. Ah, OK. CTB, the link is on the uh, website. On the website. Yeah, sure. We're sure showing. And so this will be in the evening. But in the morning, at 6.30 AM, we'll have uh, our monthly dedication of merit from the uh, recitation of Great Compassion Mantra. It's like 6.30 to 7.30. And we will start this coming, actually Sunday evening, our three weeks Chan session at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery. Chintranshis right now is writing on the website all the informations. So we will have a slice changes on our everyday uh, virtual Buddha hall. That means that at 4 a.m. we do like uh, always every day uh, morning ceremony, but it'll be a little bit shorter, shortened from 4 a.m. to 4.45. We'll keep uh, three steps, one bow and Dharma reflections. Three steps, one bow is from 7. Mm, 7 30 to 8. 7 30 to 8, and our reflection from 7 15 a.m. to 7 30. We'll have no noon Amitabha recitation for the three weeks. For three weeks. Yeah. We, Until January 15. We'll uh, uh, start again to, to back to our old, old schedule. So from for three weeks, are no, no noon Amitabha recitation. 6.30 will have evening ceremony, but also a little bit shortened version, 45 minutes. And during the three weeks of period, also on Thursday evening, Jean Foshe will not have a lecture on Infinite Light Sutra. And he will return to lecturing after January 14. Right, and anything mm -hmm. else? Uh, that's it. So, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. That's, uh, there will be a quiz and I would like everybody online please to recite those changes precisely. Uh, no, kidding. That was a lot of changes. They will be posted soon. It's as we speak, the changes are going up. So um, I would fail if I had to take that quiz. But in general, what we need to know is there's a three week, 21 day Chan session happening at Gold Mount, at uh, <laughs> Gold Mount, Berkeley Monastery, which will make changes in the schedule. So if you want to stay in touch with the schedule, the ceremonies are going to be much abbreviated. So go to berkeleymonastery.org. And in a short time, those changes will be available for you. Alrighty. Okay, that's going to do it for us this week. We're going to recite Medicine Buddha's mantra for the relief of folks who are suffering in the COVID epidemic and pandemic is becoming endemic. Ben and I were mentioning that uh, there are voices that say we're all going to get it even and so if you're vaccinated and boosted It'll be less severe, 
but uh, seems like it's going to be hard to avoid if you're out in the world. So what we want to do is learn this mantra. There, is, uh, there are sounds here. Um, this is the Sanskrit version. We've done a Chinese version um, every morning in our uh, morning chanting. The Namo Boche Fadi Bisha Shu Julu Bilioli, that's the one. And Bilioli Vaiduria Namo Boche Fadi is Bhagavate Bisha Shu by Sajiraj Guru. Uh, so uh, when it says Baisha Jay, Baisha Jay, Baisha Jia, that's in the, the Chinese is Bisha Shu, Bisha Shu, Bisha Shu, Sammo Jedi Soha Svaha. So we're doing the Sanskrit, which preceded the Chinese, but they're equally efficacious. Um, learn the Sanskrit. Why not? Add that to your, uh, your available library of chants that you have that you can do. And face-to-face -face with suffering of COVID-19 or any of the related miseries, bring out this mantra. Uh, recite it. It keeps our minds... Uh, grounded and and focused and it also puts out into the world this wonderful vibration of healing and health balance so let's dedicate the merit wherever you would like that uh, energy to go here we are an opportunity to bow to the Buddhas. I'll ring the bell three times. You're welcome to join me if you care to. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. And we have a picture of Master Hua. Bow to our teacher if you care to. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Much gratitude to all the volunteers who helped this lecture go out to the world. 
appreciate it. Happy holidays. Omitofo, everybody. Bye-bye.